Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Targeted Therapy Forum ALK and ROS1 session by GRACE, the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker for this session regarding ALK therapies. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Chul Kim, who is an assistant professor at Georgetown University, focusing on thoracic oncology, and he's an attending physician at the MedStar George Georgetown University Health. Um, so without further ado, let's have Dr. Kim um, join us. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for the uh, introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me um, today. Uh, I'm going to talk to uh, you about the, um, the ARC therapies um, and, you know, preparing this uh, lecture um, made me realize that how much advances we have made uh, in, in this area in the uh, past 10 years. So I'd like to review uh, the currently available therapeutic options and also emerging uh, treatment strategies for the treatment of ALK fusion oncogen positive non-small cell lung cancer. So as we all know, ALK a fusion oncogene positive non-small cell lung cancer accounts for about 5% of um, all lung cancer cases. And uh, below, I'm showing the data from uh, one of the biggest series in the field, uh, the data from Memorial Sloan Kettering using their impact next generation sequencing, showing the rate of arc fusion uh, event um, was about 4% in this big series. So arc fusion oncogene was first identified in non-small cell lung cancer uh, back in 2007 by a group of Japanese investigators. So in the study, they studied a surgically removed sample um, from a 62-year-old male with lung adenocarcinoma. And interestingly, the patient also had a history of smoking and found that EML4 ALK fusion gene was responsible for the growth uh, and uh, development of lung cancer. Uh, in uh, further experiments, they show that um, the ALK fusion oncogenes were responsible for uh, tumor growth uh, and formation, as you can see in the figure bottom. Um, and all the uh, eight mice uh, that received cells that were harboring ALK fusion uh, genes uh, were able to develop um, the tumors, as you can see. Since the initial landmark discovery, there has been a lot of uh, research um, studies showing uh, diverse partner uh, genes uh, in the setting of ARC fusion oncogenes. Uh, and EML4 is the most common fusion partner for ALK, and there are many uh, variants even in the EML4 ALK fusion oncogenes. And variants may uh, impact protein stability and also development of resistance such as G1202R. Uh, and this is well illustrated by uh, a study uh, uh, led by Dr. Lean, um, who is the uh, uh, host of the session, uh, where uh, patients who had variant three EML4 ALK genes, uh, fusion genes, uh, had a higher chance of developing G1202R as opposed to those with the variant 1 didn't really develop G120R as a resistant mechanism. ALK gene is located on the short arm of chromosome 2 and the inversion of a short segment of chromosome 2 can result in the formation of ALK fusion chimeric protein that constantly provides growth signaling to the cells uh, by activating downstream growth signaling pathways such as RAS, MAC, and ERG pathway, and also PI3 kinase and AKT pathway. We have five FDA approved ALK therapies, uh, with the first generation drug being creosotinib and uh, first approved uh, more now 10 years ago, but for first line use, it was approved back in um, 2013. For second generation ALK TKIs, we have 
alectinib, brigantinib, and seritinib. Uh, alectinib and seritinib um, were approved in seven, 2017, and brigantinib last year in 2020. And most recently, uh, FDA approved third generation drug uh, called lorlatinib uh, pretty recently. And as you can see here, these agents can target other major molecules uh, beyond ALK, for example, crizatinib can target MET and ROS1, and lorlatinib can target ROS1 and, and TREC. Um, perhaps those um, result in differential safety profiles that we see with each drug. So how do we select therapy um, for the treatment of ALK fusion positive non-small cell lung cancer? And there are several metrics that we look at, of course, we are interested in looking at the effectiveness of a drug. Uh, and in terms of parameters for effectiveness, we have objective response rate. Um, and this equals to um, you know, tumor shrinkage, you know, how many patients you treat, um, you know, how, what is the percentage of a significant tumor reduction you see in those patients. And progression-free survival, survival is defined as the time between the initiation of the treatment to disease progression or death. And overall survival is, of course, an important metric to look at. And this really um, translates to a longevity of a patient. And now we have several drugs. It's important to look at the CNS activity, so how good the drug is for brain protection. Second, we need to understand safety of the drugs. Uh, we often look at uh, serious treatment-related toxicities, such as grade 3 or higher toxicities. But also, it's important to um, you know, review chronic low-grade toxicities. If you have uh, grade one or two, we consider those mild, but if you have grade two diarrhea, for example, um, that can really interfere with your quality of life. And as I mentioned briefly, each drug has unique side effect profile. And so uh, I will spend some time going over some of the unique side effects that can happen with each drug. And other factors include, of course, cost of treatment and comorbidities. So does the patient have any men mental um, you know, problems or heart condition and other um, medical conditions that may interfere with the treatment? So crizatinib, our first generation uh, ALK-TKI was compared with the chemotherapy um, in two randomized clinical trials. And in both trials, profile 1007 and profile 1014 uh, in the first and second line settings, Crizatinib has shown superior uh, progression-free survival compared with chemotherapy, firmly establishing crizatinib at the time, uh, the preferred treatment choice. However, we have now next generation ALK TKIs, and I'd like to review data um, of three landmark clinical trials. So first is Alex, next is ALTA1L, and then Crown that really assess these next generation ALK TKIs with crizatinib, which was at the time the standard care. So the ALEX trial compared in a randomized fashion uh, the crizatinib um, uh, and, and alectinib and has shown a uh, significant progression for survival favoring alectinib with the hazard ratio for disease progression or death uh, 0.47. And this really means that the risk of um, disease progression or death was reduced by 53% if, you, if the patient received alectinib compared with those who received crizotinib. And also alectinib has, I'm sorry, alectinib has excellent CNS um, penetration and protection of uh, disease uh, progression in the brain shown on the figure uh, on the right. Uh, at one year time point, about 9% of patients who were receiving alectinib had progression in the brain as opposed to 41% of patients who were receiving crizotinib had progression uh, in the CNS space. And this is updated data on Alex trial. Um, the median PFS um, was 35 months with alectinib versus uh, 11 months with crizotinib. And hazard ratio um, showing on the right was about the same as the original report, 0.3, uh, 0.43. And then the median over survival uh, was uh, favoring alectinib over crizotinib. However, in this clinical trial, crossover um, to alectinib was not allowed. What it means is that if the patient was receiving crizotinib, they were not allowed to receive alectinib in the trial. They might have access to other 
uh, drugs outside of clinical trial, but at least not in the clinical trial setting. Uh, if you look at the table uh, on the bottom, uh, there's a five-year-over survival rate. Uh, with alectinib, the five-year-over survival rate was 63%, and chrysanthinib was 46% with difference of 17%. An ALTA-1L trial assessed brigantinib and compared that with uh, chrysanthinib. Uh, the trial is pretty similar design with Alex, uh, with uh, the only difference, uh, few, the, with the few minor differences. Uh, here, they looked at, again, the progression-free survival and that favored brigantinib. So if you receive brigantinib, the risk of disease progression or death was reduced by 51% compared with um, uh, receiving chrysanthinib. And the hazard ratio is a metric that we use, um, and the number looks pretty similar to electinib. Uh, on the right, uh, brigantinib has also excellent activity in the brain. And here, uh, if you receive brigantinib, uh, the risk of disease progression in the brain was lower uh, compared with chrysanthinib. And this is the updated data on ALTA1L. Um, showing pretty similar hazard ratio of 0.49 as the original report. Uh, here in this trial, crossover was allowed. So if you um, were assigned to receive chrysanthinib, then had this is a progression. In the clinical trial, you're allowed to receive brigantinib. And they that makes explain why there was no uh, statistically significant over survival difference in this trial as opposed to Alex trial, where we saw some separation of Kaplan Meier curves. And lastly, the Crown trial compared lorlatinib with the chrysotinib. And if you look at the graph on the left, uh, there was significant, pretty remarkable, uh, you know, separation of the curves even from the beginning, favoring lorlatinib. And here, the hedge ratio was 0 0.28, uh, suggesting that there was about 72 percent reduction in the risk of disease progression or death if the patient received lorlatinib versus chrysanthinib. Uh, and lorlatinib has very good uh, penetration and activity in the brain. Uh, and here, they look at the hazard ratio for intracranial progression. So if the patient received lorlatinib, um, the risk of disease progression in the brain was reduced by 93%, uh, favoring really a lorlatinib in this setting. So putting all the data together, we have now uh, five drugs that were approved by FDA, with three being most um, uh, standing uh, out uh, among the five. And, and those are electinib, brigatinib, and lorlatinib. Um, and I mentioned that there are some differences in clinical trial design. And brigatinib, um, the alta one trial that assessed brigatinib, they allowed crossover. And they also allowed prior chemotherapy uh, use for advanced disease, and uh, that might have caused slightly different patient population um, compared with the Alex and Crown trials. But with that in mind, the hazard ratios um, were you know, between 0.28 to 0.49 in these trials, uh, with the best uh, hazard, hazard ratio seen with the uh, low Latin compared with other drugs. In terms of toxicities, there are unique side, uh, side effects of each drug. Uh, with electinib, um, we see anemia, usually mild, uh, and not a lot of patient needs um, transfusion, for example. And myalgia is something that is being seen in 16% of patients. And LFT, the liver function test, is something we need to monitor for all patients, uh, regardless of the drug of choice. And hyperbilirubinemia, uh, which is one of the uh, liver enzyme abnormalities, can be seen in 15% of patients. With brigatinib, we have seen hypertension and then muscle enzyme called creatinine kinase elevation in about 15% patients. And uh, uniquely, brigatinib has uh, been associated with early pulmonary events where patients can develop some respiratory symptoms initially, even after one or two doses, um, and so, uh, with associated radiographical changes on CAT scan, but only 3%. Lorlatinib has been associated with uh, several other side effects, uh, hypercholesterolemia, uh, so, uh, meaning the uh, cholesterol level can go up, um, and a lot of patients require the treatment for those. Uh, and increased weight has been seen, and in some cases it can be pretty uh, significant uh, uh, in my clinical experience and also from the literature. And then peripheral neuropathy is seen in about one third of patients. And notably, cognitive effects, mood um, disorders can be seen in 
in 15 to 21 percent of patients and cognitive effects include memory impairment and mood effects uh, include anxiety and, and depression and if we look at the grade three or higher so serious um, or high grade side effects uh, it was the highest in crown trial 72 uh, percent with lorlatinib and 41 percent with alectinib but direct comparison a little bit difficult because the side effect profiles are different from these drugs. Um, if you look at rate of discontinuation, it was 7% in lorlatinib um, and 13% with alectinib. So which agent should be the first preferred first line option remains really controversial uh, in the thoracic oncology uh, community. And uh, these two editorials really highlight um, the, uh, the, the issue, the controversy, and uh, for those who are interested in understanding more about the, the nitty-gritty details, uh, or um, I would highly recommend that uh, uh, these these two editorials that are published in JPO. So, if the treating doctor and the patient decide to uh, use one of the second-generation drugs, such as alectinib or brigatinib, and there was a need to switch therapy because of disease progression or other problems. Now we know that lorlatinib has activity in this setting. And so the trial B7461001 was a registrational phase two study of lorlatinib. And in this trial, uh, we saw about 40% uh, response rate in patients who received at least one second generation EG, um, of TKIs. Uh, and what was interesting, I highlighted um, at the bottom here, um, the activity of lorlatinib was more pronounced if you have ALK mutations uh, in either plasma or tumor um, analysis. So this is a potential treatment algorithm. Uh, if you have a patient with advanced awkwardly arranged non-small cell lung cancer, one of these three drugs, alectinib, brigatinib, or lulatinib, can be chosen. And if there is a one or two sites or even three uh, sites of progression, you know, one can consider doing local therapy uh, and following the paradigm of oligoprogression. progression. But if the progression is global progression, we see multiple areas of progression, then we really at that point need think about uh, molecular profiling. And in my clinical practice, I like to send uh, CTDNA using blood first, and then uh, as needed, I also perform tissue-based uh, 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 NGS. And the results from the molecular profiling can inform the uh, next line of treatment uh, for patients. The mechanisms of resistance to ALK uh, TKIs can be very diverse, and there are two uh, big categories. One is uh, being um, what is ALK dependent resistance, where we see secondary mutations in the ALK tyrosine kinase domain, and uh, ALK gene amplification has been reported. In terms of ALK independent resistance, there are uh, bypa uh, bypass signaling pathways activation that we see, and also lineage changes. And in terms of bypass signaling pathways, as highlighted in Dr. Lin's paper um, in Cancer Discovery, uh, there are multiple other growth signaling pathways that can be activated, causing resistance to ALK TKI therapy. Uh, and in terms of lineage changes, we have seen uh, EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and also small cell transformation in rare cases. What are the emerging treatment options? So I highlight here a few trials, and this, uh, you know, by any means, not comprehensive, but there is a trial at MD Anderson uh, using brigatinib and local consolidated therapy in ALK rearrange advanced non small cell lung cancer. Here, the idea is to use uh, local uh, therapy such as radiation to eradicate resistant clones that may um, play a role in development of resistance in the future. And there is a next generation of TKI called TPX0131 uh, that is being uh, shown, uh, that is being developed in clinical trials. Now there is a, a phase one and two trial. Uh, the trials are open in the United States and you know, Australia. And there are combination therapies uh, such as lorlatinib in com combination with chrysanthinib, binimatinib, which is MAC inhibitor, uh, or uh, TNO155 chip 2 inhibitor. And this trial is being uh, conducted at MGH, where Dr. Lin um, practices. There is an interesting trial combining ansartinib, which is another uh, of DK with chemotherapy and bevacizumab, uh, ongoing at MD Anderson. And this paradigm uh, of combining uh, chemotherapy and TKI has really panned out well in EGFR um, lung cancer. And we are uh, using sort of that paradigm in ALK positive setting uh, to see whether combination chemo TKI therapy has superior outcomes. And there is a trial uh, combining seritinib and trimethine, which is MAC inhibitor, uh, I believe, at UCSF. So to conclude, 
Uh, Electinib, brigatinib, and lulatinib are all excellent preferred first-line options. Uh, when we look at the data, uh, lulatinib has been associated with the numerically superior uh, progression-free survival benefit. However, it is unclear if using lulatinib upfront uh, is really the best treatment strategy. Uh, unique side effects of each drug should be considered when choosing uh, the first-line therapy. And at the time of progression, I would highly consider performing blood-based and tissue-based molecular profiling, and the results can really help, uh, help can be really helpful to inform the choice of next line of therapy. And uh, we have seen um, really good data in terms of prognosis setting of stage four um, of positive non-small cell lung cancer. However, we need to do better and novel therapies are urgently needed to further improve outcomes uh, for our patients. Uh, and there are several studies ongoing now looking at the role of OCTKI therapy uh, in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy in early stage of positive non-small cell lung cancer. And in my clinic, we enrolled one patient recently for neoadjuvant uh, electinib uh, clinical trial in the setting of stage three disease. So uh, these um, these uh, clinical trials may um, uh, may change the landscape for treatment of um, of positive non-small cell lung cancers going forward. With that, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, in the um, Q&A session. Thank you very much.